Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. This is our regular weekly message. And today's message is entitled, Silent Watchers. God has set us Christians, and especially us pastors, us teachers, to stand on the wall and to be watchmen. Watchmen who must be vigilant so as to sound the alarm at the first sight of any and all approaching danger. But our watchmen today have become silent watchers. They look, but do not see. They see, but do not perceive. They hear, but do not comprehend. The watchmen have altogether become silent watchers, or as the King James Version puts it, dumb dogs that cannot bark. Join me this morning for a message, Silent Watchers. Turn with me, please, our scripture found in Isaiah chapter 56, verse 10 through 11. His watchmen are blind. They are all without knowledge. They are all silent dogs. They cannot bark, dreaming, lying down, loving to slumber. The dogs have a mighty appetite. They never have enough. But they are shepherds who have no understanding. They have all turned to their own way, each to his own gain, one and all. I want you to notice who this reprove is aimed at. It's aimed at God's watchmen, the ones who he placed upon the wall to watch and to sound the alarm at any and all approaching danger, as I said earlier. The idea comes from the ancient world when a wall surrounded a city to protect its inhabitants from bands of marauders, invading armies, and any such perceived danger. Towers were also built in the wall, and watchmen patrolled the top of the walls. Soldiers were stationed inside the towers as to see far distances so that they could give a warning for far enough in advance so that the people or the resting army, maybe they were sleeping because they were off duty, that they could have enough time to prepare themselves to defend their city. There is still a biblical mandate in effect for watchmen to be stationed upon the walls, to watch and to sound the alarm of any and all approaching danger. But if so, what has happened to our watchmen? Why have the majority of our watchmen all gone silent? Psalms 55 says, Destroy, O Lord. Divide their tongues, for I see violence and strife in the city. David was witnessing widespread violence. He was witnessing widespread strife. He was witnessing corruption in the city. His own son, the rebellious Absalom, had turned the hearts of the men away from King David and turned them to himself. King David's good friend and counselor, Ahithophel, even joined the conspiracy and gave the usurping prince great advice excellent battle strategy plans against the king, his father. In 2 Samuel chapter 17, verse 1, Ahithophel volunteered to pursue his friend David with 12,000 men of his own choosing. So King David prayed, divide their tongues, O Lord. This goes back to Genesis chapter 11, verse 9 when God confused the language of the people and dispersed them over the face of the earth. It's the same concept. Confuse the advice that he's given to Absalom. Verse 10 says, Day and night they go around it on its walls. What is this it that David is referring to? They go around it. The it that David is referring to is the city of Jerusalem, and the they are the watchmen on the wall. The second portion of verse 10 says that iniquity and trouble are within it, are within the city. Let's continue reading. This is what it says. 
and iniquity and trouble are within it. Ruin is in its midst. Oppression and fraud do not depart from its marketplace. David is upset with the watchmen because they go around and around the city on its walls patrolling, but they never notice the iniquity that are within the walls. They're too busy focusing on following celebrities to notice anything is wrong in their society. They themselves are caught up in unjust gain, adding house to house, field to field, until there is no more room. Verse 12 says, for it is not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me, then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. We used to take sweet counsel together. Within God's house, we walked in the throng. Now David has come to the sudden realization, the heartbreaking realization that it is not an enemy. It is not some obscure adversary that has opposed him, who has given this great advice to his son Absalom. But it's his familiar friend who walked with him in the throng up to the house of God. It is his friend, his counselor, who used to give him good advice. Now he's advising someone else against him. Today, that could equate to a fellow Christian, a fellow pastor, someone you're used to worship with in the church. You attended Bible studies together. You encouraged each other. And like iron sharpeneth iron, you would encourage it together, each other. Now, that person has turned their back on you. They're in a backslidden state and are causing confusion in the church. They propagate holy and biased sounding mysticisms like preach the gospel at all times, use words if necessary. I have no clue where that saying came from. But I'm hard pressed to believe that it was St. Francis of Assisi whom it is often attributed to. St. Francis of Assisi was committed to a life of poverty, an itinerant preacher begging for his food while preaching. And apparently he was a very powerful preacher at that. It was said that he would sometimes preach up to five villages in one single day. Often speaking from a bale of straw or from a greenery doorway in the country and from a box or on the steps of some building when he was preaching in the town. Even more, it is said of him that he preached with such passion that his feet moved as if he was dancing. Does it sound to me like someone who said, don't talk about the gospel unless you have to only live it. No, that comes from the silencers. Those who want to hush up the gospel. They will attribute things like this to heroes of the faith, to Christians who we hold in high esteem. And other Christians, today's Christians, will grab a hold of such sayings and they will propagate it. And they don't even realize that they're silencing the church. Thus, they become silent watchers. Because after all, you can't help but speak when you preach the gospel. You cannot preach the gospel unless you use words. What has happened to our watchers on the wall? The clergy, our men, and our women of God. Why are they keeping silent at such a time as this? Why did they stand silently by as our children were being murdered 
by the millions, nearly 50 million since Roe versus Wade, and continue to support the very ones who are sacrificing her children. Horrific accounts of babies being pulled from the sanctity of their mother's womb and leaving their head intact and having a surgical scissors plunged into the back of its head to open a hole big enough to thrust a hose into it and suck the brains out. Why is it acceptable for educators in our schools and professors in our college and universities to give assignments to their students to have homosexual experiences or to encourage them to experiment with drugs or experiment with premarital sex. Why is that acceptable? But a big stink is made if a teacher leads one child in prayer. Some Christians keep silent while our prime time airwaves are bombarded with filth indecent and obscene language and some will support it all in the name of entertainment why are christian churches not standing up for our children who are being exploited in today's society a lot of christians do not support or stand for morality but will support a certain political party, no matter what that party's propagating. Is it any wonder that the book of Revelation calls today's church lukewarm? You are a lukewarm church, therefore I spit you out of my mouth, God says. Some church leaders are looking up to rock stars and movie stars as heroes. They use them as examples to define what it means to actually have made it. Their children are besties with movie stars that actually dislike the church. And if you tell some Christians that their favorite musician or favorite music artist may have, just may have an unclean spirit because of the, what they say and the way that they act on stage, you will bring the wrath of the Titans down upon yourself. Even worse, some pastors are playing secular music in their churches as they serve Holy Communion. But I ask, what does the things of God have in common with the things of mammon? What agreement has light with darkness? And we're not just praying and wanting revival. We're expecting revival. Do you want revival? Get back to the basics of God. Get the filth out of your homes. Remove the accursed things from within your borders. Begin to see your Bible as your favorite book. I've heard big time pastors say, if you read just one book this year, make it mine. But what are you talking about? Is your book better than God's book? I'm telling you, if you read one book this year, let it be the B-I-B-L-E. And if you read a second book, then let it be mine. That's a much better aphorism. We no longer put God first. We're too interested in the things of this world. Fame, fortune, celebrities. Some Christians know more about celebrities and what they're doing than about God and what he's doing. Get the ungodly music out of your house. You don't need that in your house. You are a child of God and you have that filthy language in your house. Turn off that explicit language on the TV. Turn it off. Maybe it's not you. Maybe it's your children bringing that filth into your house. It doesn't matter. Get it out. Clean your house. Yeah, but... Brother Kenny, I don't want to be called an extremist. Well, that's the problem right there. We are too afraid of what others think about us. We're too afraid of what kind of labels they put on us. 
Paul and Silas did not worry about what people thought about them. They knew who they were. They were extremists for God because they understood the impact of eternity. And that's why they were accused of troubling the city exceedingly. Do you know who's the biggest accuser of the brethren besides Satan and the deep state? It's the church. It's our fellow brothers. Those from another denomination. Those who have no power in their church and no life in their services. They're quick to accuse another brother. Some make their, that's how they build their social media platforms, by accusing other brothers, by making a, a scene on social media. Have you ever knocked the top off of an ant, ant pot pile? Watch what happens. The ants come pouring out. And they come pouring out by the tens of thousands. They all come out in one accord. What do they, they do? They come out to defend their home. They come out to defend their way of life. They come out to defend each other. If only we Christians were like that. One for all and all for one. Standing on the promises of God. But as for today's church, we fight against each other. We tear each other down. Bless God, we ain't supporting him. He ain't from our denomination. And Lord forbid if a church ventures to believe all that God has promised us, promised his church, us believers. Again, that would bring the wrath of the Titans down on you. Judah became a nation of silent watchers. And look what happened to them. 2 Kings chapter 25, verse 1 through 7. And in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came with all his army against Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And they built siege works all around it. So the city was besieged until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. God sent prophets to warn them, intercessors to stand in the breach for them. Prophets like Isaiah, whom the church tradition has it, they sawed in two. Jeremiah, whom the officers advised the king that he should be put to death. So they arrested him, threw him into a well, and he sank down in the mud. Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom they murdered between the temple and the altar, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 23, verse 35, are only examples of a few. And did they listen? No, they rejected the warnings of the watchmen. They preferred to live in ignorance and look at what happened next. Verse three. On the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Then a breach was made in the city and all the men of war fled by night by the way of the gate between the two walls, by the king's garden and the Chaldeans were around the city. And they went in the direction of the Arabah. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho. And all his army was scattered from him. Then they captured the king and brought him to the king of Babylon at Riblah. And they passed sentence on him. They slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him in chains and took him to Babylon. Because they refused to watch, they declined to warn, and they snubbed the thought of listening to those who did. Those who stood on the wall, those who sounded the alarm, those who warned, danger, danger because they snubbed the warnings. They ended up being slaughtered, had their eyes put out, and then shackled and thrown into prison. They became silent watchers. 
They saw the corruption, but because of dishonest gain and the hunger for power, they refused to adhere to the warnings from the watchers on the walls, and they themselves were overpowered. Look at what the next verse in our scripture reading, verse 11 says. The dogs have a mighty appetite. They never have enough. But they're shepherds who have no understanding. They have all turned to their own way, each to his own gain, one and all. In verse 10, God called them dumb dogs that cannot bark. Now he adds in a little of their characteristics. He says that they are, the dogs, have a mighty appetite that is never satisfied. But they are supposed to be shepherds. Shepherds are supposed to have understanding, but these shepherds have no understanding. Yet, they're shepherds. Shepherds without understanding. They have all turned to their own way, each to their own gain. They're hungry for gain. They're hungry for power. They're hungry to make a name for themselves in their society. And so we have the truth of the matter. Everything they did was for profit. What is in it for me? If I speak up about that, they'll stop paying their tithes. Then what will we do? Now I'm not saying that all our watchers are like that. I'm not saying that most of our watchers are like that. But what I am saying is, if we had more watchers who were not silent, we would not be in the mess that we're in today. But because the church is filled with silent watchers, not just the pastors, not just the deacons, but also in the pew, we're silent watchers. Pastors are given the enemies of freedom, standing novations when they come into their churches. They give suppressors of right thumbs up because they identify with anything else but Christianity. It's a very sad time that we live in. But it only goes to show that Jesus is coming back real, real soon. He's coming back to get us. So we would better get on the wall. We would better start watching. We better start sounding the alarm because Jesus is coming back for those who are watching, who are waiting. And if you're watching and you see, you better sound. So what I wanna ask you today, are you ready for the return of Jesus? Are you ready for that day when he'll split that eastern sky to come back to get us, the watchers, those who are waiting, those who are watching, those who are believing, those who have not soiled their garments with this society, with the filth that's going on in our society? Are you one of those? If you're not, would you like to be a watcher? Would you like to be arraigned in pure white garments, washed by the blood of the Lamb? If you would, but you're not sure how, here's how. Just repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, I come to you today and I ask you to forgive me for I have sinned. I have not watched. I have not listened to those who have watched. I have not heeded the warnings. I repent. And I ask you now, Lord, to help me to be a watcher. Give me boldness and confidence that I might sound the alarm. That when you come back, Lord, you'll find me doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Thank you, Jesus. For it's in your name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do is to get a Bible. 
and begin to read your Bible. Get a highlighter, read that Bible and highlight the Bible. Those verses that are meaningful to you. Learn them, memorize them. Use them in your times of trouble. Times when the devil comes against you. The times of temptation. Use those verses to defend yourself and to defeat the evil one. Then I want you to join a Bible-believing church. One of those churches who still believes in righteousness, who believes in holiness, who still believes in calling sin, sin. And not trying to cover it up, not trying to make excuses for it. One who prepares you for the return of Christ. Join that church, be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing exactly what it is you should be doing. He said, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now enter in to the joy of the Lord. I want to say thank you so much for joining us today. Jesus loves you. We love you. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Holy Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.